Hello, I'm here with Dr. Mary Freistad. Um, Mary Freistad um, is a board certified clinical psychologist specializing in the assessment and treatment of children with mood disorders such as depression or bipolar disorder. She's also a professor of psychiatry, psychology, and nutrition at Ohio State University. So today she's going to tell us a little bit more about bipolar disorder in children and adolescents. So to get started, um, I was just wondering, if a parent was concerned about their child's feelings and their behavior, how would they be able to find out if their child had bipolar disorder? I think it's really important to do some self-education and then to make sure that you seek out professional guidance from somebody. The discipline doesn't matter so much as the clinician really has a good working knowledge of and experience with this diagnosis in children. What kinds of treatments for bipolar disorder have scientific support? You know, we really want to think about bipolar disorder in a biopsychosocial treatment model. So typically medication would be kind of an A number one part of treatment, but not all of treatment. Having adjunctive psychosocial care is very important. There are a variety of treatments that have been developed. The one most studied is the psychoeducational psychotherapy model, and that is now in the classification of uh, efficacious is considered probably efficacious. Okay. And what kinds of medications would a child with bipolar disorder typically take? If you have what's called bipolar 1, uh, the kind of the classic manic phase and the depressive phase, uh, atypical antipsychotics are the first medication uh, used or mood stabilizers. You have to be very careful with kids because often there's comorbidity, and then you might think about adding on, if they have ADHD, a stimulant, you want to go low and slow with that. Uh, there might be a lot of depressive symptoms, and possibly an SSRI would be added in, but you have to be really careful because either of those medicines could potentially really trigger another manic or hypomanic episode. Within the biological intervention range, we also have some early preliminary data suggesting that nutritional interventions uh, might be beneficial. We also know that in the depressed phase of illness, phototherapy can be helpful, and for kids with very severe mood dysregulation, sometimes kind of at more of an, I don't want to say end of the road, but way further on down in treatment, we think about ECT. Okay. So treating this disorder seems pretty complicated. Which, what kinds of professionals could help me do everything that you said? Sure. You would need, for the medication piece, uh, you definitely need a prescriber. Uh, most commonly that would be a child and adolescent psychiatrist, but not necessarily. Certainly in some practice settings, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners do the prescribing or primary care physicians. And that would take care of the medication piece. If but having the psychosocial piece in place also is very important. And again, the discipline of that person matters less than their experience with the disorder, their ability to make a careful diagnosis of the mood disorder as well as its comorbidities, and then really being able to develop in conjunction with the family a treatment plan that will address the family's needs. Okay. So um, what does a psychosocial or a psychological treatment for bipolar disorder look like? What would you know, a child or a parent be doing? Sure. Uh, number one, you really need to understand the symptoms. You need to have labels to be able to talk about it. Uh, you need to be able to really see it as not some evil trait of the child, but really very uncomfortable symptoms that the child is experiencing. So the educational piece is really, I think, a number one in the psychosocial realm. Once you get past giving the information and making sure that the parents and child really understand it at their level, then you want to move on to symptom management strategies. And that gets back to our good old-fashioned problem-solving, uh, communication skills, and in particular for kids with bipolar disorder, really emphasizing what we call healthy habits, paying a lot of attention to sleep patterns, sleep hygiene, eating patterns, and exercise. Uh, exercise is very important because it's a non-pharmacologic antidepressant. Um, and we also know that for our kids who go on to atypicals, it's very easy for them to really chunk out. Uh, they can really gain a lot of weight on those medications, which isn't good for their self-esteem. It's not good for their physical body, their emotional body, their mental body. So we really want to help them 
uh, be very careful and prudent in their choices. We also, again, going back to that nutritional piece, have some really interesting pre preliminary data suggesting that the nutritional content of food matters and there are some supplements that may be beneficial, uh, again, for kids who are struggling with this disorder. Okay. So it sounds like a doctor might be involved mm -hmm. in helping a parent treat their child with bipolar disorder and certainly someone um, that knows about psychological treatments. Um, what about the school? That's a really important piece. And what we work on with parents is helping them, how to, uh, helping them understand how to construct both a mental health team and a school team. And helping one of our sessions uh, in, in um, PEP is to help parents understand what's out there, what they can realistically ask for, how to ask for it within the school system, because it's, it's a tough system to na navigate if you haven't been trained in it. Uh, we who are clinicians sometimes get confused as to how to seek services in various districts. So it certainly is confusing for parents. So we want them to understand what the process of getting, uh, you know, what's a multifactored evaluation, what's a 504 plan, how do you get an IEP, what is an IEP, what kind of classifications could get you there, really helping families navigate that some what mysterious system of the schools. And um, what is usually a parent's role in the treatment? The younger the child, the more important the parent. And I think that goes without saying in most of our interventions. Mm -hmm. um, but kids really will need a lot of coaching, and we really work on helping parents coach their children through. The parents learn the skill, the child learns the skill, but we're only there an hour a week or an hour and a half a week, uh, maybe two hours a week. But all those other hours in the week, families at home or the child's at school. So we really want the parent to learn how to effectively coach their child in a way that doesn't feel to the child or the parent like nagging. And are there any other things that parents should be doing to help their children? Taking care of themselves. This is, if we, we tell parents that this is really a marathon, not a sprint. So you can't put all of your energy into it full force and keep going full force. Now if you're at an an immediate crisis point, your child's been hospitalized after a suicide attempt. Let's face it, that is a crisis. But you can't stay in crisis mode forever. Nobody can endure that. So you've got to learn how to slow down, pace yourself, take good care of yourself so that you're in there for the long run for your child. And you're also modeling healthy choices and healthy behavior for your child. Take time to have fun, keep a balance, get enough sleep, do all those things we call free medicine. And are there any common treatments for a bipolar disorder that have no scientific evidence? We have no evidence for play therapy. We have no evidence for psychodynamic therapy. We do have emerging evidence, again, for the cognitive behavioral family system sort of approach. That's really the crux of what psychoeducational psychotherapy is. There are several others who have developed models of care that kind of in that same sort of category. Uh, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, which is pretty similar uh, to the family system CBT kind of an approach, uh, has some preliminary evidence, and then there's some really early interesting evidence for dialectical behavioral therapy for adolescents with bipolar disorder. But that's the extent of the psychosocial literature. And what about the um, medications that you were talking about? Are there certain ones that, should, that don't have scientific evidence? There are some very nice reviews, and the, the evidence for the medications is coming in at a pretty rapid pace. So now we have a number of medications that have FDA approval, okay. typically for 10 to 17-year-olds. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the atypicals, there's a, a host of atypicals that fall under that category. Uh, and there's some evidence for the mood stabilizers. So it's really important to do your research and, again, work with a prescriber who's really up-to-date on psychopharmacology. Okay. Um, and how will bipolar disorder affect a child as they get older? If you think of every transition point is a time when children are particularly vulnerable. So a child moving from elementary school to middle or junior high school, and then moving from middle or junior high school up to high school, and then in particular as they're launching from high school into post-high school plans, be that going off to college, moving away from home, uh, may perhaps living at home, attending a community college or vocational training. So any of those transition points are particularly important. But we always think about how's the child doing with their peers, at home, at school, and if they've got a job, how are they functioning in those various settings. And certainly bipolar disorder has the ability, left unchecked, to really wreak a lot of havoc in each of those domains of function. So we really want kids to understand the disorder, learn to see it as something separate from who they are as the core of them, themselves mm -hmm. and learn to manage those symptoms just as somebody with diabetes learns to manage the diabetes so that the diabetes doesn't ruin their life. 
So what caused, you know, what will, what causes children to have bipolar disorder and does it really matter? Does the cause matter? A bipolar disorder is one of the most heritable conditions that we have across all disease states. So certainly genetics plays a very large role. And if we think about cause versus course, cause is to a great degree a biological reality. But when that child develops bipolar disorder and what the course of disorder is, we believe is strongly influenced by psychosocial factors. So if you have a very chaotic home life, if you've been abused, and you have that biological underpinning that you might develop, you might develop at five. Well, that's really different than if your first episode comes at 25, when you've already developed a sense of who you are and how you function in this world. So the longer we can stave off an illness that maybe will erupt at some point in a person's life. I think we've done that person a favor. So we're really interested too, when we think about the whole bipolar spectrum, coming in at that low end of the spectrum, the cyclothymic disorder and the bipolar, what's called not otherwise specified, mm -hmm. and getting intervention started there in the hopes that we can potentially stave off a full manic episode, full prolonged depressive episode. Okay. So since um, you mentioned that bipolar disorder is very heritable, does that mean if somebody has a family history of it, their child will definitely get it? There's no 100% guarantee. Kind of a general rule of thumb we use is if one parent has a mood disorder, you've got about a one out of four chance that, the other, that, that any offspring will. If both parents have a mood disorder, you're closer to a three out of four chance. And those are just kind of ballpark estimates to keep in, in mind. So it certainly is a risk factor. There's no guarantee. No guarantee in life. Okay. And is there, um, is there any other information that a parent you think would, should know about bipolar disorder? If you are suspecting it, it's really good, again, going back to that notion of self-education and then also finding a practitioner who's very well educated because there are many disorders that can look like bipolar disorder. You need to make sure that any kind of a medical explanation for the behavior has been ruled out. You want to check for a trauma history. You want to look for every other reason that that behavior might be there so that you've really carefully considered why you're making this diagnosis. If a child gets the diagnosis, to the best of our understanding, it is probably a lifelong condition. So we really encourage careful, thoughtful, take your time in making the diagnosis, because once it's there, it will probably stick for the lifetime. Thank you.